Well, thank you. Well, it's great to be here um, to kick off your meeting this morning. You don't have to believe everything they said in the video, though, but yeah, it's kind of nice. Actually, I'm really glad they show the video before I speak because, number one, it proves to all of you that I used to be able to do all that stuff. <laughs> and the other reason, when they show me on this big screen, I'm so big. Because, you know, let's be honest, gymnasts get lots of comments from people who only watch gymnastics on television. So many of the events that I go to, there's always someone that's going to walk up to me and um, look down and say, wow, seen your sport before on television, but I never realized you guys are so little. <laughs> there's a reason for that. See, if you only watch gymnastics on television, think about it. What do you see on the television screen when you watch my sport? You see gymnasts, right? And, and judges and coaches and officials that are working the floor. So if you think about it, Everyone on the floor is either a gymnast or, yeah, an ex-gymnast. So everyone on the floor is a midget. So you really can't tell that we're just not tall until after the competition. And it's always then when an ex-NBA star who's working for CBS Sports walks up to his well, congratulations, you had a great competition. How'd you feel? Risk. It's written in my rule book that I have to take chances. I can play it safe, I can leave out all of the risky skills, pretty much then guarantee an excellent score, maybe even as high as a 920, it's a great score. But as you know, there's always someone else out there that's willing to take some chances. Originality. But I can't base or pattern my performances after someone else. My goal, of course, if you think about it, is to try to get to the point where everybody else is watching me. Virtuosity. If I do something on the pommel horse, the 1,000th time, with as much focused attention to detail and as much enthusiasm, as I did the very first time, I'm going to be a better gymnast. In 1984, these three principles, risk, originality, and virtuosity, helped Peter Vidmar lead the U.S. men's gymnastics team to its first ever Olympic gold medal. I was competing once in the World Championships over in Budapest, Hungary, about six months before the Olympics, and going into the horizontal bar finals. You all know what the high bar is, right? That single little bar about nine feet above the ground. Going into high bar finals, I was in second place, ahead of all of the then Soviet and Chinese gymnasts. One uh, great gymnast from Japan ahead of me. What got me into the finals was a risky combination of skills. And it's hard to describe, but it's one where I swing around the high bar, and I let go of the bar, and I fly straight up over the bar. Do a half turn, straddle my legs, come back down, catch the bar. I immediately let go again, do a back flip with a half turn in the pike position, come back down and catch the bar again. Trust me, it's hard, okay? Um, I made it in the preliminary round of competition, got a great score. In the warm-up session before the final round, where I'm supposed to go for the gold medal on high bar, all of a sudden I can't do this combination of skills successfully, start to worry, start to panic. Looked at my coach and I said, hey, hey you got to help me. i got 15 minutes till the competition starts. I can't do this skill right. What is wrong here? It's my only big trick. i got to do this. Uh, let me take a look at it, Peter. Oh, just, just pike more on your swing. Uh, arch more through the bottom next time. Try that instead. Um, let go of the bar a little bit later. All these wonderful, valid coaching tips. Until I got the ultimate coaching, teaching, and leadership wisdom. We've all heard it before. Just do it right. <laughs> and for a moment, I thought, forget it. I'm not going to do it at all. I'm going to leave it out. So what? I won't get the risk points. Who cares? I can still score a 9.8 with everything else. That's a great score. That should be enough to put me on the victory stand, which was the goal in the first place. But I knew it wasn't enough to put me on top of the victory stand. See, if I left that skill out, if I scored even as high as a 9.8, I knew under those circumstances that might be enough for the bronze medal with a ton of luck with silver. But realistically, I'm not going to win the gold medal without doing that skill because other guys in the finals are taking chances. At least one of them will be successful with his big trick. He's going to end up on top. And as soon as I realized that, I thought, wait a second, this could be the only chance I ever have in my life to become a world champion at anything. And I'm going to play it safe and guarantee that I don't become one. Might as well fall off trying. Looked at my coach and said, I'm going to go for it. I said, okay, let's do it. So I really focused in on what I had to do. The guy that was in first place blew it, made a mistake. All I have to do now is make this performance successfully. I'll become the world horizontal bar champion. Kind of a neat thing. So I uh, chalk up my hands, signal the superior judge. The big risk, he still comes at the beginning. Swing around the high bar, let go of the bar, flew straight up over the bar half, turned, straddled my legs, came back down, 
caught the bar. I immediately let go again, did that back flip with a half turn in the pike position, came back down to catch the bar, and the bar wasn't there. <laughs> Look, I know you're not gymnasts, but you're all educated enough about my sport to know this. You're only allowed to do one dismount in each performance. So I, I missed the bar. I dropped about 12 feet to my stomach, <clears throat> hit the mat, first dismount, got back up, grabbed the bar, finished my routine, landed my real dismount perfectly. Big deal. Uh, I jump off the platform, walked away, grabbed my bag, left the arena. I was devastated. I blew it, choked under pressure. I, uh, I failed on, on why world of sports to make it worse. <laughs> I think I placed eighth. Eighth place in the world. That's uh, not too bad. There were only eight people in the competition. So <laughs> I'm walking back from the arena to the hotel. I'm, I'm all alone because nobody wanted to talk to me. And about halfway there, I stopped. And I promised myself something that basically went from here right down to here. Nobody heard this but me. It wasn't this great dramatic moment. But I meant it when I said it to myself. I just said, never again. I will never make that mistake again. I've got to stop taking that skill for granted. Because I train that skill like everything else I do in, in my sport. So for the next six or seven months sitting up to the games, almost every day, I go back to that horizontal bar, work a little bit extra on that risky release move that I tried to describe to you. And fortunately for me, that event, the high bar, with those skills in the routine, was one of the events in which I ended up scoring a perfect 10 at the Olympic Games. Peter went on to capture a gold in the pommel horse competition, scoring a perfect 10. Today, Peter Vidmar is well known as a motivator who helps people around the country achieve the success they desire. So I used to have a goal. This is a very noble goal, to be the last person out of the gym at the end of each day, which is pretty hard to do when the rest of the team has that same stupid goal. <laughs> Workouts were long, but every once in a while I could outlast those guys. I'd be in an empty gym by myself 15, 20 more minutes just to work about, about that much harder. And I use 15 minutes a day as an example because it's so easy to take a small increment of time like that and blow it off as worthless. I mean, come on, Peter, give me a break. You're going to tell me that 15 minutes a day has got some major impact on my life. Please. Well, if an athlete trains for three hours a day in a sport and chooses to train an extra 15 minutes a day, after one year, that's an extra 91 hours. Well, based on a three-hour-a-day workout schedule, that's an extra month of training at the end of the year. I know that when I walked into any World Championship or World Cup, I always wish I had an extra month to get ready for that thing, but then it was always too late. Winning in business is a lot like winning in sports. You have to set yourself apart from the rest, seize opportunities, and perform ordinary skills in extraordinary ways. Using his Olympic preparation and experiences, Peter motivates others to put out the extra effort needed to win in business and life. Originality is somewhat different, fairly self-explanatory, right? That means that I do something new, maybe something that nobody else has ever done before. And that's the most exciting part of my sport, because think about it. For me to be in a gym, to be working on some sort of gymnastics skill that just maybe nobody else has ever done before, it's exciting. Until you stop and ask yourself this question, why is nobody else trying this? And you think maybe they have, but they haven't survived. Let me show you an original skill I used on pommel horse at the games. You saw earlier when I did my dismount, I went up to a handstand on one arm, right? And then I got off the horse and I landed on my feet, right? Well, back when I was competing, going up to a handstand on the pommel horse was the new trend on pommel horse. Only in the past couple of years had gymnasts been going up to a handstand on the pommel horse. But the only time they would go up to a handstand was at the end of their routine because they couldn't figure out a way to get down from the handstand without just getting off the horse. So the handstand was always the dismount, the last trick. And if a judge saw a handstand, he knew the routine was over. He put his head down and add up the score. Well, I thought, what if I could fool the judge? What if I could figure out a way to do one of those handstand things and don't get off and just stay on the horse somehow? And that's basically what I did, and I'll show you in a moment where I'll do some circles. I'll swing under the end. I'm going to turn. I'm going to go up to a handstand like the dismount that I showed you. But from the handstand, I'm going to drop to the center of the horse into my scissor sequence. That's that pendulum swing that we do back and forth with our legs apart. That's a required skill in our sport. The first time I did this unique break, as we call it, into the scissor sequence in a competition, I really surprised the judge because they did it at the beginning of the routine. I mean, I, I chalk on my hands, single the judge, jump up there, swing around, I go right to a handstand. The judge thought, what happened to Vidmar? Oh. 
The guy just freaked out. He forgot his routine. He's getting off. I'm going to kill him. He's excited. 2.3. And he looks back up, and I'm still going. And my score jumped about two-tenths of a point, consistently from what it had been previously, just by adding this little original skill. I think the keys to, to originality, the key to innovation and creativity in my sport is stop watching the other guy. Now, I have to know where the trends in my sport are going. Part of that knowledge comes from knowing who the competition is and, and what they do. I can learn from that. But I can't base your pattern of my performances after someone else. My goal, if you think about it, is to try to get to the point where everybody else is watching me, where I'm the standard of excellence. Now, that's not easy, but that's the goal. And one of the things that we had to do as a team was we had to stop playing the game called catch-up, and I'm sure you can tell what that is. We would go to these big events overseas, maybe a World Cup or a World Championship, walk into the gym for the training sessions that precede the event, look across the gym, see a great gymnast from China or Russia jump up on the rings or the parallel bars and do something that we've never seen before. And we'd say, wow, hey, did you see that? What a great skill. Oh, why didn't I think of that? Run back to the gym the next week and we learn it sometimes just like that. No problem. And we say, Phew. It wasn't even that hard. Come back to the next important competition. This time, fairly impressed with ourselves, because now I can do that skill, and you're not so tough. Walk in the gym, look across the gym, see the same guy, this time on the floor exercise or the pommel horse, whatever. Do something even more innovative and unique, and we'd say, wow, did you see that? What a great skill. <sighs> Why didn't I think of that? Run back to the gym the next week, and we learn it sometimes again, just like that. And it's always too late. They get originality. Uh, we get nothing. We're just being copycats, doing just what it takes to keep our heads above water. One of the reasons why our team won the Olympic team gold medal was every member of our team stopped playing catch up. Did things on our own that were unique and that were original. Let me show A you talented stuff. speaker and performer, Peter explains his winning strategies using live demonstrations on the pommel horse. Don't worry, he brings his own. With such a unique approach, it's no wonder that Successful Meeting Magazine ranks him among the top 10 corporate speakers in America. Well, here it is. It's the end of the day. I'm tired. My ankles are swollen. I tore three more blisters in my hand. My shoulder hurts. I feel sorry for myself. Gymnastics stopped being fun two hours ago. I want to go home. At this point, many times, Tim and I would convince ourselves that we could have happened to us the ultimate gymnastics experience. Whether it's realistic or not doesn't matter. We convince ourselves it is for that moment and say, what if? So I look at Tim and say this. Once again, end of the day, just three of us left in the gym. Hey, Tim. Put some pressure on, okay? I don't care how you feel. L let's just imagine right now, it's, it's the Olympics. It's, it's the men's gymnastics team finals. The U.S. team's on their last event of the night. Just happens to be the horizontal bar here. Last two guys up just happen to be Tim Daggett and Peter Vidmar. We haven't even made the team yet, so what? And here's the catch. This is where we thought it was funny. We start to laugh. I'd say, Tim, let's just imagine that we're neck and neck with the People's Republic of China, reigning world champions. We've got to perform our routines right now perfectly to win the Olympic team gold medal. And we'd say, yeah, right. <laughs> we're never going to be neck and neck with those guys. They were first in the world six months earlier in Budapest, where I had my unplanned departure from the horizontal bar I told you about. We were fourth. We didn't even win a medal. It's not going to happen. But what if? Would we be nervous? <laughs> yeah. So I'd walk over, chalk up my hands, close my eyes. In this empty gym, I could vividly imagine that I was instead in the Olympic arena, that there were 15,000 people there, 2 billion watching me live on television. I got one chance to make this performance successfully or we're going to lose. My heart starts to pound. I'm not tired anymore. Tim's over in the corner of the gym and he would say something like this. Next up from the United States, Peter Vidmar, just like the loudspeaker at the Olympics. I'd imagine my name is called and get ready to go. Now, you don't perform when you feel like it in my sport. You perform only when the judge allows you to perform. That's when he pushes a button that makes a green light go on and he raises his hand. And the longer you wait for that green light to go on, clearly the more nervous you're going to get. Trent Demas, who won the gold medal on the horizontal bar in Barcelona in 92, had to stand before the high bar waiting for his green light to go on. for six minutes. It's a long time to wait. Can you imagine Michael Johnson in the blocks? For six minutes till the gun goes off? What that do to shred his nerves? The reason why Trent had to stand there and wait was because the judges were disputing the previous performer's score. They couldn't come to an agreement. He had to stand there and wait while they argued. 
It's called a judges' conference. Julianne McNamara, for the same reason, had to stand before her Bannels beam routine at the 84 games for nine and a half minutes. It's an eternity. Worse than waiting for Tanya Harding to fix her skate lace. <laughs> Tim's over in the corner of the gym in charge of this imaginary green light. And after a long time of saying and doing nothing, trying to throw me off guard by waiting, finally, when he thought I least expected it, he would shout, green light, because I never really had a green light in the gym. He said to say it. I'd imagine the green light goes on. Look at my coach. Imagine my coach is the Olympic judge. He would raise his hand. I'd raise my hand right back, turn, face the bar, grab the bar, and begin my routine. Now, if I fell off the bar there, if I made a mistake there, that ruined my day. I was miserable. Why? Because I placed importance in what I was doing. I didn't say, which I easily could have said at the end of a long, tiring day. I didn't say, so what, Peter? You fell off the high bar. Who cares? It's just a workout. You're tired. Big deal. Just go home. Go home. You just work hard tomorrow. Just work twice as hard tomorrow. Doesn't matter. It's just another day. No. I felt like I lost the whole competition. I placed importance in that routine. I felt like somebody from NBC Sports is going to walk up to me right now and say, well, Peter, you just lost the Olympic Games for your whole country. How do you feel? <laughs> I'm going to Disney World. <laughs> but if I made my routine successfully, I felt great. I'd land my dismount. I'd get all fired up. Oh, yes. Drive home every day after a workout like that one and say, wow, I just won the Olympics today. That was great. I'm going to do it again tomorrow. Got me excited. Now, we did that for practice because we knew realistically, and let's be real about this, it's not going to happen. But it's good practice because it taught us to focus, to be diligent at something. When? When we didn't feel like it. Most important time to put forth effort. That's when you know the most about yourself. Well, a funny thing happened on July 31st, 1984, and I'll finish with this. It was the Olympic Games. It was the men's gymnastics team finals. Uh, the U.S. team was on their last event of the night. It just happened to be the horizontal bar. Last two guys up just happened to be Tim Daggett and... Peter Vidmar, and here's the catch, and all of a sudden we weren't laughing because it really wasn't funny anymore. We were, neck, we were neck and neck with the People's Republic of China, the reigning world champions, and we had to perform our routines perfectly to win the Olympic team gold medal. Well, there are six gymnasts per team, only five scores count, so if one guy makes a mistake, that's okay. Throw out the low score. <clears throat> count the five best scores. Follow me? Wouldn't that be great in accounting? First guy up, Scott Johnson, was the unheralded hero of our team as our leadoff man got us off to a tremendous start by getting great scores at the beginning from which the rest of the team's scores can build. That is the psychology of that team event. The first guy up is critical to the team's score. But after a phenomenal games, Scott lets go of the high bar for his triple backflip dismount. On the third flip, he opens up too soon. He stumbles forward, touches his hands and knees on the ground, makes a mistake, and we thought, oh, no. Chances are, next five routines have to count, pressure's on. Next guy goes up, Jim Hartung, Scott's teammate from the University of Nebraska, the backbone of our team. This guy never makes mistakes. Under all this pressure, he does a great high bar routine, lances dismount, jumps off the podium or platform, which is about the, the same height as this stage, runs around the platform, and then Jim heads straight over to me. Now, I have no idea why he singles me out, but he runs over to me. He's huffing and puffing. He's shouting above the crowd noise, taking off those leather hand guards. He says, hey, Pete, don't worry about it, man. It's not that bad out there, okay? Just relax. Just enjoy yourself. Just have a good time. He was happy because he, he was done. <laughs> Olympics were over for Jim. He scored a 9.8. It's a great score. Bart Connor went up next and scored a 9.9. .9. Mitch Gaylord went up next, did that amazing flip of his, caught it, 9.95. Tim Daggett went up after Mitch, and I wish I had a film to show you that routine. Couple skills he invented. His dismount was a double layout. That's a double back flip with your body straight with a full twist on the second flip, which basically means that you don't see the ground till it hits you. He lands perfectly, and he scores. Yeah, perfect 10. Then it was my turn. <laughs> I told you five out of six scores count, didn't I? How many guys just performed? Five, yeah. Well, let's just take a peek at the first five scores and add them all up, including Scott's routine with that little mistake. Add them all up. Guess what? We just won the Olympic team gold medal. Forget me. We just won the gold medal. 
Scott's Scott's mistake wasn't really that bad. The other four scores were so high, they helped to offset Scott's mistake, add them all up. That meant that even if the last two performers left from China, Li Ning and Tong Fei, their two best gymnasts, even if they scored perfect tens on the floor exercise, it's not going to be good enough. So with Tim's perfect ten, we had just secured the USA's first Olympic team gymnastics gold medal, male or female, since the 1904 Olympic Games in St. Louis. That's when wooden club juggling, shot put, and long jump were three of the gymnastics events. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's changed since then. But because it's locked up, this means that Peter Vidmar can fall off the high bar 58 times. We're still going to win the gold medal. And all of my teammates behind me, below the podium, all of them are yet done and celebrating. But none of them, none of the coaches, and no other human being told me that we had just won. So I walk up there still thinking, oh, this is it, Pete. You don't make this, we lose. Now let me make the picture for you. The crowd's cheering wildly. Tim did a phenomenal job. They have not given him his score yet. I can't go till he gets his score and I get the green light. So I'm pacing back and forth thinking, oh, I've got to make this routine. What are they so excited about? All of a sudden, Tim scores a 10. And the crowd goes nuts. They saw Tim's perfect 10 and you couldn't hear yourself think in the arena. The cheers were so loud. I look at Tim's perfect 10, and I said, Yay, Tim. <laughs> and then the green light went on. Right before the green light went on, I looked at my coach. This is a man that I've been in the gym with for 12 years. His name is Makoto Sakamoto. He was the USA's top gymnast in the 60s and early 70s. He was there on the floor as the USA assistant coach. He looked up at me, and he gave me a smile. I looked down and gave him a smile right back. And then he said one thing. They went from here right down to here. He said, okay, Pete, let's go, all right? You know what to do. You've done this a thousand times. Just like the end of every day back at the gym. Let's just do this one more time and let's go home. You're ready. That's right. I'm prepared. I didn't wait till it was too late to figure out how to handle a situation like this. I did this every day at the end of every workout. So all of a sudden, instead of standing in this Olympic arena with the 15,000 people there and the 2 billion on television, in my mind, I put myself where? Back at the UCLA gym at the end of a day with maybe three people left in the gym. And in my mind, when I raised my hand and signaled the Olympic superior judge, always a friendly face, in my mind, I'm signaling my coach just like I used to signal him every day at the end of every workout. Turned, faced the bar, grabbed the bar, began my routine, uh, finished it not quite as easily as I'd like to describe it to you now, but uh, we had a motto that's going to sound simple-minded to you, but it worked for me, and this was it. Practice as if it's competition, but compete as if it's practice. That was our motto. Every day matters. There is no such thing as just another day. What you do Peter you Vidmar do it, uses his practice. skills as a leader and motivator to create powerful performances for America's top corporations and associations. Peter blends a lively spirit with the ROV principles to show audiences how to realize their own potential. In addition to his Olympic success, Peter has an economics degree from UCLA and works as a gymnastics announcer for CBS Sports. Anybody that follows international gymnastics should always know that Amy Chow will be in the hunt for first place in an event like this. Peter's energy and enthusiasm win over audiences time and time again. Dozens of satisfied customers strongly endorse his work. 